just so you all know that we are being recorded. Uh, this information will be shared, um, uh, posted publicly on the city's website and on the project website afterwards, in, in addition to uh, the, the chat um, conversation that we have uh, here today. We will answer every question that we can and then publish those responses afterwards. But I did want to officially welcome you all to uh, 415 West Washington pre-entitlement public engagement session uh, today. And um, uh, we introduce you to our team here that we have uh, that um, is representative of both our team from the city and our consultant team at Smith Group. Uh, my name is Michael Johnson and, and uh, with my colleague Dan Kincaid, I co-lead our urban design and planning team. I'm based here in Ann Arbor. Uh, and um, uh, you'll also hear from uh, our colleagues Lauren and Brandon today. And um, uh, Jennifer Hall is on with us today from the Ann Arbor Housing Commission. Um, and I uh, wanted to pass it over to uh, Derek Delacourt uh, for just a brief introduction before we kind of get into the, the full content today. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, I'm not going to take up too much time. Um, we've, we've, as a group, have been at this for quite some time now, and you're going to see a lot of that information as the presentation comes out. We're certainly available to answer questions at the end. Um, the meeting we're at today is kind of a transition point uh, for the project team. Um, up until now uh, and recently, we have been engaged in um, community engagement and reaching out and talking to stakeholders, neighbors, the community, city council, different boards and commissions, including the Historic District Commission, about uh, how to go about utilizing this site to um, achieve some objectives um, that uh, started with a directive from council um, to try to use this site to meet some of the city's uh, affordable housing goals. And that has evolved into a, a significant list of, of objectives that we're trying to balance, um, recognizing um, throughout this process that to do so um, requires a, a, a certain amount of trade-off um, to, to get those accomplished, especially when there is no established budget for this site. And, and we're operating on the premise that whatever we do with this site and, and whatever improvements are made um, need to, the, the, the revenue or the value of this site needs to be able to generate uh, the funds to do so. Um, there's no money budgeted for this site. And there's, there's very little money uh, budgeted to achieve the goals that uh, Michael's going to go through on this site. The point of the project we're at now is, is we've developed a concept that we are moving forward with, um, with council's directive um, into the entitlement process, which is basically the approval process. So we switch from a uh, public facing um, um, directive or, or process that, that seeks to engage to a technical compliance process which takes this concept and moves it into a process where very similar to a developer, if we were to just put the site out to RFP, uh, very similar to a process where we go through and, and try to make sure the concept that we believe um, is the best chance or the best possibility of achieving these objectives and, and meeting those trade-offs um, is can meet the city's requirements and ordinances and excuse my dog, of course, of course this is exactly when I have a puppy wants to start barking out the window. So I'll, I'll let you, maybe he's telling me to shut up here. Um, and, and we start we start the process of actually facing the planning commission, the historic district commission, the city council, uh, the boards and commissions of the city and, and, and reviewing this concept for technical compliance with the city's codes and ordinances um, to see if that this site can be approved and then a development partner sought um, for the development of the site um, at the end of this process. So that's where we're at. Um, this meeting is a, a meeting that is required by code of any developer. Um, the requirements of it are established in code. Um, and this is kind of the first formal step of where, this is the first step where you would normally see a development project come into the city would be a public participation meeting. So we have done all the, what would be the normal pre-work in a very public manner um, as, as the, the development team assigned to this project and now transition into what is the formal approval process. So this is the first step in that transition and I'll, I'll turn it over to Michael and, and let him start that conversation. So thank you. Thanks, Derek. So just um, again, super appreciative of everyone uh, willingness to spend your time with us this, um, this evening, this afternoon. Um, 
you know, this is a impo uh, super important site that, that we've uh, uh, heard and seen from a lot of you. And I know that there are also some, some new voices uh, to the table today. I just wanted to level set um, the expectations of this meeting today. Um, we are going to uh, pretty quickly go through about 30 minutes of content uh, via slides. If you have any questions as, as we go along, uh, please type any questions into the chat and we'll answer as many as we can uh, following our, our kind of presentation. Um, uh, as you do that, we urge you to, to make sure you're being respectful of uh, all ideas and perspectives that are being shared and, and try to avoid the finger pointing uh, that, that is, um, uh, you know, kind of indicative of, a, of let's make sure this is a robust community conversation. Uh, as you do that, make sure we're distinguishing between I know facts and I think op opinions. Um, if, you, if there are any inappropriate comments or language, um, we're going to have to ask for you to, uh, and we'll remove you from the meeting. Uh, and then, you know, we uh, will record uh, this meeting there, um, uh, on, and, and publish it to the website, and then we'll also publish all questions and answers to, to the website uh, following the meeting as well. Um, just to kind of get a sense uh, for the room, as, uh, as, as you all uh, know that the, the kind of online platforms uh, has some benefits certainly from a from an engagement perspective but it has some challenges as well it would be good to just get a quick sense if you wouldn't mind uh just to kind of uh where everyone's coming from and and their engagement in this conversation to to, to date so if you have a cell phone with you uh and you, you want to participate we just have a couple of quick survey questions that we'll go through real quickly um uh, so on, in your cell phone, in the, uh, in the text message, uh, two lines, you would type 22333. And then in the, in the message line, you would type 415WASH. Uh, and that would that'll allow you to enter into um, uh, a survey uh, uh, platform. And then um, I'll just give everyone a, a, a quick sense, sense to do that. Um, uh, the first question that, that we have for you is just a quick and easy one. Do you live in the city of Ann Arbor? Uh, as we kind of warm up, uh, warm up the group here and it'll be, uh, feel free to type your answer A for yes, B for no, or C for unsure. Um, and we'll see if those come up. We had a request to restate the information. It's on the top of the screen that Michael's sharing, text 415 wash to 22333. Thanks, Brandon. Okay, um, I'll give everyone maybe 10 more seconds if you want to uh, type in your answer. Uh, looks like to date we have about 12 people that have responded, 85%, 86% 86%, uh, live in the city and 14% and uh, do not live in the city. And no one's unsure, so that's a good, a good thing. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to the next question real quick. Um, and this is a, just a quick question about what, what ward, in what ward do you live? Um, so if you live in ward one, it would be A, type the text A, two is B, three is C, four is D, five is E, and then if you don't know, it would be F, and if, it, if, you, if you don't live in one of the wards, you would type G. So looks like we have people getting a hang of this, appreciate it. Um, have 20, 21 responses in so far, 50, just over 50% live in Ward 5, um, with the second highest percentage coming from Ward 1. I'll give everyone 15 more seconds to type in your answers. Great. So still a couple more coming in. Excellent, thank you so much, everybody. And then um, 
another question here about just engaging um, uh, folks in engagement with the topic to far, so far. If you if you've participated in any of the previous engagement sessions over the last um, several years and and months uh, regarding 415 West Washington Street. We got a pretty good good mix. 60, 60 or 65, 67 percent have, and the 33 or so percent have not. So this is this is great. We'll have a nice mix. I'll give everyone another again, uh, 15 or 20 seconds to type in your answers. Seems like everyone's getting the hang of this a little faster. So that's great. Okay. Well, thank, thanks all for that. That certainly helps us, uh, I think, level set some of the, the context and, um, uh, you know, in, in this format, help understand a little bit about where folks are coming from and look forward to your continued chats to help us understand that as we move forward. So I just wanted to um, use a couple of slides here to uh, provide a little bit of context of kind of where we've been to date and um, and uh, what some of the council and DDA directions that are that are driving the work and so um, we began work uh, on behalf of the city uh, back in April of 2019, uh, driven by a council um, resolution uh, to, to look at the, the city -owned, several city-owned properties, including 415 West Washington, uh, with the series of bullet points uh, that you see below uh, under the purview of the Historic District Commission. Um, uh, the city the commission, uh, Historic District Commission did issue a notice to proceed uh, to allow all existing structures to be uh, demolished, uh, but still anything would require the approval of the commission. Uh, important component for the tree line trail, uh, in the floodplain, chimney swifts, and then support affordable housing were all uh, um, included in that resolution. Um, we then um, had a couple of, a series of resolutions that uh, encouraged further uh, community engagement um, in 2019. And then, um, and then approved the next phase of the kind of pre-entitlement process that we're working on in, in July uh, that you can see there in 2020. Uh, and then uh, in 2021, the DDA also added to that a resolution uh, as they helped to, to fund some of this work. Um, and you can see the bullet points um, that, 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 that guided that resolution uh, very much in line with the original uh, resolution uh, from city council. And so, you know, maybe just a quick definition and level setting of pre-entitlement. I know that's a, a little bit of a, a planner jargon term. Several of you have probably heard it before in the context of this site um, and 350 South Fifth. Uh, but um, essentially what, what this is is a partnership between the Ann Arbor Housing Commission and the city um, to develop a series of community driven priorities for this site written into pre uh, policy prior to engaging any private developer. Um, it certainly includes an appropriate level of zoning and plan approval, uh, which in this case, uh, we're recommending a PUD or planned unit development process, uh, which takes the shape of a concept plan, which is not, not as um, prescriptive as a, um, as a site plan approval that many of you are familiar with throughout the city. And so, um, I just wanted to emphasize that while, as Derek stated, we're coming to you uh, with rec you know, recommendations that, that could be included in, in such a PUD, uh, this is really the beginning of a process. Uh, we uh, uh, still need to uh, receive uh, HDC uh, uh, Historic District Commission approval, uh, upon which uh, then we, if, if that were to move forward, would move forward uh, with developing the series of supplemental rec uh, regulations. You'll see a draft of those today for your for your review and for your comment, uh, and then uh, go through go through a series of city and department um, staff reviews before going to the planning commission and and two city council readings. Uh, that's just to have the uh, PUD process approved, and then at that at that point, the concept plan and the PUD. Uh, could be used to then um, develop 
an RFP to uh, partner with with a developer, potential partner, um, which then that 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 individual or party would have to go through the more restrictive site plan approval process. So, um, fair, you know, we've had a lot of engagement and 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 still have a long long way to go. And appreciate your comments along along the way as as we do that. Um, just a quick comment on why PUD rezoning, and we do think this is the right mechanism for this site. Um, uh, in the city's zoning code, the PUDs uh, are intended uh, to, you know, kind of permit flexibility in uh, using use of certain land uh, that require maybe innovation, uh, variety in design layout, uh, certainly uh, to support affordable housing. Um, and um, you know, allow for the kind of necessary flexibility to achieve a series of of goals. Um, uh, um, and so we did think that that was the the right mechanism um, for, for this site. And so, um, just briefly uh, update on kind of where we've been uh, since the DDA approved their resolution. Uh, we had a, an initial meeting with the Historic District Commission in July. Um, and then we're, we're had a follow up with uh, the Historic District Commission in September, and then um, uh, we see where we are today. Uh, and next step would be um, <clears throat> a series of planning and, and zoning submission meetings uh, with city staff, uh, and then um, uh, approval from the HDC and the Planning Commission before going to council. Um, I think the kind of appropriate timeline for, for all of that could be between now and, and March. Um, and that, of course, is all built on uh, the history that we've uh, gone through to date, um, uh, you know, built upon all of the engagement that, that we started back in 2019 that you see listed uh, on the screen here today. And I think just, um, you know, worth noting as we kind of get into the the, the meat, if you will, of the presentation here um, today and, and a lot of the content um, is that Derek alluded to this, right? There's a series of community-driven goals that we've heard directly from the community um, uh, and, and you all as it relates to uh, potential redevelopment of the site. Uh, we do feel like in, in, our, in, in our initial evaluation and, and listening that, uh, that um, addressing all of all or parts of these will certainly require some some sorts of trade-offs and, and a robust discussion. So uh, those goals are remediating contaminated brownfield site. And these are generally, I will say, generally in order of priority that we've heard uh, to date. And so, you know, um, uh, we have asked this question several times, but uh, remediating the contaminated site, building a segment of the tree line trail, providing affordable housing, preserving the chimney for the chimney swift habitat, contributing to the character of the Old West Side Historic District, um, providing uh, minimal floodway impact and, and improving the, the flood plain from the existing condition and then um, improving safety on, on West Washington Street. And so the, the framework uh, that, that we're presenting today uh, seeks to address several of those goals. Um, and it starts um, by looking at the 2.57 acre site uh, bounded by Washington Street on the north the rail, railway on the east, Liberty Street on the south, and then you know one block away from Third Street on the west. Um, about 0.989 acres of that site is in the flood way, uh, which we're proposing to uh, preserve as uh, both an open space and uh, a, you know aspect of the tree line trail uh, that that has been master planned to to go directly through the site. Um, and then, and then looking at that 1.68 acres that is in the flood plain, uh, with appropriate setbacks uh, for fire access and and others, uh, and 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 really um, setback along Washington Street to align with the residential homes, uh, a smaller uh, buildable area that reduces the overall uh, impermeable surface within that area to, to improve the the impact to the flood plain, uh, preserve the chimney. And then, um, you know, of course, work to find the right massing that might be acceptable uh, with the adjacent uses and topography. And so, you know, what this PUD submittal will look like is actually um, not super 
complex or, or, or complicated. And so um, what we're going to try to do to you to, for you today is actually outline on the next three slides, you know, what, what might be included in that, that PUD and then um, pause for a second. And then on the next maybe 15 or 20 slides, walk you through then what, that, what kind of development could, could be accomplished within those guidelines. Um, we, we, we found that, that some people have a hard time um, grasping the concept of the PUD and the, the kind of white box nature of what we're, what we're talking about without seeing some visuals. <laughs> so we're gonna try to do that here for you today. We'll see if, it, if it's helpful. Um, so uh, the site is currently zoned PL or public land. It is master planned for D2 zoning, which would allow up to 60 feet in height and 200% of floor area ratio. Um, what we're presenting to you today um, is, is um, a, a, a building that, that goes up to, steps up to 70 feet at the highest point, but steps back considerably as you get towards 3rd Street and Washington Street. Uh, it's about 155% floor area ratio. So uh, we're trying to work that right percentage, but uh, uh, certainly below the 200% allowable floor area ratio. And uh, it's a it's a massing that um, that looks like this. And so I'll just walk you around uh, the view that you're looking at here with the railroad tracks in the foreground on the east side of the site, Washington Street uh, on the right side of this diagram and the and the Y is kind of on the right the farther right side of this diagram, and Liberty Street on the far left side of this diagram. <laughs> and so from Washington Street. Uh, that proposal is um, a building that that starts at the back side of the existing chimney that would be preserved for chimney swift habitat, which is about 35 feet set back from the existing property line. Um, and that building would be uh, 22 feet high uh, to that at that point. Uh, also set back 31 feet from the west property line. Um, again, 22 feet high. Um, and then the highest point that this building would get uh, along that west property line would be 46 feet height um, along that entire west frontage. Um, as you step further towards the east, it goes up uh, starting at 65 feet off of that property line, the ability to go up to 70 feet with the, the mass of this building fronting on the tree line. And we'll show you how that kind of looks in the context, for, for example. Um, and then the other thing that would be included in the PUD would be a series of um, uh, benefits and or prohibited uses. And so this is just a starting list uh, that hopefully helps give fodder to the conversation tonight about what things you feel uh, should be included in, um, as, uh, in, these, in these lists of benefits and prohibited uses. But for example, those things, of course, uh, must include um, meeting the HDC's requirements uh, as defined by the Secretary of the Interior. Uh, we've heard quite clearly from the community that we need to preserve the chimney for the chimney swift habitat and remediate environmental contamination to meet, of course, the residential uh, development standards, um, including the tree line trail, targeting A20 goals, um, considering uh, improvements to the West Washington streetscape, especially if you think about that additional setback between this building and the YMCA, is there some public benefit we can we can give to improve the safety along Washington Street? And then and then be clear about once we agree on a massing, running the financial pro forma to understand uh, the quantity and um, level of a, of affordable uh, and or below market rate units that we can accommodate. And so it's been clearly. You know, I think articulated in many forms to date that this site, because it sits in the flood um, in the flood plain, is not eligible for federal, state, or even local subsidies for affordable housing. Um, but that does not mean uh, that we cannot have affordable housing uh, here. Uh, any development of residential needs to uh, in Ann Arbor. Um, needs to sit one foot above the 500-year flood uh, floodplain. Or the, or the 0.2% annual chance floodplain. 
And so um, raising the potential building uh, residential uses out of there uh, would still allow us to have residential uses. And then, um, you know, think about are there other sources that we can either demand from uh, developers or other partners uh, to subsidize some affordable units here. And that's certainly within the purview of this, uh, this study here. Uh, additional uh, meeting stormwater goals. We've been clear, uh, no new structures in the flood way. Uh, I just mentioned the elevating the residential uses, uh, no net loss of flood storage in the floodplain, of course, uh, reducing the impervious services from the existing floodplain and then reducing the existing building coverage from the floodplain. Um, we'll, we'll get into the discussion about parking and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions there. As you see today, uh, the proposal is to provide 0.9 to essentially one parking space per one residential unit, uh, at least um, as an option here. Uh, that would be, um, you know, certainly uh, what we think the market would, would demand here from a residential um, uh, standpoint. And I think that's just um, a, a, a conservative starting point for a negotiation with the developer and with the community about the appropriate amount of parking to serve uh, a building like this. This is in the context, of course, <clears throat> as you all know, that uh, the existing use of the site provides about 150 parking spaces today. And so um, if, if we think about a building at the scale that we just showed, uh, we would actually be slightly kind of reducing the total quantity of parking. Um, but um, uh, the, the decision about <clears throat> what, the, how that fits into the community and what that means as far as parking dedicated to residential uses and or public uses, I think is a, is a good, good conversation to continue. Um, and then of course, we would develop work with the, the planning staff to develop a series of prohibited uses, which we started the list here and we'll continue to add to that list as well. Um, with that, I'm just going to um, walk you through pretty quickly a series of slides that say, you know, assuming that what would love most of the conversation to focus on today is the content that I just walked through as, as it relates to refining that kind of a PUD recommendation. Um, as I stated, uh, as we presented this before to several groups, including the Historic District Commission, Historic District Commission there has been I think we've found individuals being challenged with like taking that abstract information and understanding then what that actually means for uh, a site that we all that's in our neighborhood that we live and walk past and all those kind of things. And so what we want to do on the next couple of slides is just walk you through what kind of development could be uh, could be developed with the, that kind of um, previous um, uh, PUD rec uh, recommendation. So of course, the acknowledgement that this is in the Old West Side Historic District um, and fits within a, a really interesting uh, context from an architectural standpoint, uh, uh, you know, a series of, um, of residential homes uh, that emphasize pitched roofs and, and kind of wonderful, lovely wood details, um, uh, you know, in the context of being protected by the Department of the Interior um, standards. You know, you also have buildings that uh, use materials like brick and uh, expose themselves in a flat roof and step massing, as you see from the mark. Um, uh, the church with the kind of lovely brick detailing and the welcoming recessed entries. Um, it's a kind of brick and glass from the YMCA. And then as you, you know, transition adjacent to the historic district, which is also still part of this context, you see, you know, brick and punched windows and art and color and, and the uh, industrial adaptive reuse at Liberty Loft, murals, um, uh, and, and then, of course, the, the brick chimney of, uh, the, of the chimney swift. Um, also, you know, the kind of loveliness of the Old West Side historic district neighborhood with continuous sidewalks and uh, residential landscape with with seating and plantings and um, these these kind of unique moments where industrial bridge abutments meet meet art and murals and uh, bikeways. Um, you have moments of parking uh, with the with the Y, and then um, a kind of a neighborhood, of course, that's that's known for its uh, just the really lovely scaled residential streets uh, as well. And so that that forms the context. 
for a site plan uh, that you know uh, could look something like this in the context of the TUD that we just outlined. And so um, certainly go, moving from le uh, right to left on this diagram, uh, the, the idea that we provide um, the space for the tree line trail uh, to come through the site at grade, it's a 20 foot wide trail segment, um, uh, the ability to connect that back to the pedestrian and bike infrastructure as you as you move uh, uh, along Liberty Street and then across Washington Street and then start to ramp up, which is part of the master plan for the tree line trail up and over Huron as as that path looks to uh, get to the river in an in an elevated fashion. The idea then that the rest of the floodway could be um, uh, utilized for some landscape spaces and making sure that we get we get the detailing of that right to meet the floodway um, considerations. Uh, the 1.68 acres of upland, you know, of, of flood fringe, floodway, uh, flood plain or flood fringe area um, dedicated to a, de a development that sits back uh, off of Washington Street as, as we've articulated and off of the west property line. Uh, to allow for um, both parking and fire lane access on all sides of the building. And then uh, the idea that like like um, current condition, uh, building could be accessed, uh, parking could be accessed both from Washington and from Liberty, but designing that, that, that access in a way uh, that does not become a cut through, but rather becomes um, something that, that serves the building and the fire uses uh, as well. And then, you know, as we articulated pr previously, I think when you begin to set this building back, uh, the opportunity to do something different with Washington Street presents itself. And so, uh, can this street meet the bike boulevard goals? Can it provide a safer way for drop off and parking at the Y uh, and for pedestrians crossing that street as well? And so, uh, migrating to now an aerial view. Of, of what, you know, within this PUD, a project like this could look like. Um, you see a view with Liberty Street now on the right and, and here on, on the left, you can see the Y um, adjacent and then uh, a building that, that steps back from the West property line, steps back from the Washington Street property line and, and potentially even uses the roof plane uh, for both, um, you know, functional use uh, and green roof, but also for, for solar um, uh, power as well. This is a similar view, and I can go through this pretty quickly, but just to orient you, Huron on the right, Washington in the middle, and Liberty Street, uh, you can see the, the what a building like this could look like in the context of the scales of, of the Y. Um, the, of course, much larger uh, City Club apartments that sit up the hill, uh, the Mark and the St. Paul Lutheran Church. And then a little bit closer view that gives you, I think, a little better sense of the setback along Washington Street, um, both um, from a building perspective and from then a height perspective. And then heights in line um, uh, with the top of the roof of the Mark um, and, and the YMCA, as you'll see on, on some section slides coming up. From a youth perspective, uh, the white box that we we started with um, certainly could have considerations for a residential lobby and some residential frontage um, so that that Washington Street uh, frontage actually um, is responsive to its, its context uh, while then having uh, you know parking access off to the side and, and, uh, and below the building to accommodate that uh, floodway and floodplain considerations, and then a primarily residential use building with some of those rooftop amenities. Um, this is a, a little bit of a challenging graphic, but we thought it was important to just show the proposed um, massing that we just showed in yellow superimposed um, on the existing building that, that sits in blue. And so you can see uh, the additional uh, that existing building sits almost on the property line, maybe two or three feet off of the property line. And so this is a you know 35 feet setback, an additional 30, 32 or 33 feet from from that existing building, and then the additional setback from um, from the west property line as well. 
And then a couple of sections here. So you're looking at um, uh, kind of section elevation drawing for those of you that are familiar with this, this kind of drawing. Um, uh, essentially, if you were to cut a line through the middle of the building uh, looking south, this is, this is what you'd see. And, and it's, for representation standpoint, on the, on the right of this diagram is, is Third Street. And you can see the residential um, properties along Third Street with the garages behind. Uh, the grade here come, does fall, fall off and fall down to where Washington Street sits, uh, 415 West Washington sits. You can see then that building with the courtyard <clears throat> and that 46 foot roof line and the 70 foot roof line in the context of both buildings uh, towards Third Street and uh, towards the City Club apartments. And then we have a, another um, section here that is actually kind of cutting from the YMCA, the Y here on the right to the Liberty Loft on the left, looking towards the west. And you can, so you can see the Y um, West Washington Street as I'm moving from right to left on this diagram. The setback to where the chimney sits at about that 46 uh, foot high level, uh, the, the 20 foot, 22 foot high rooftop, and then the 70 foot high um, residential building uh, with then the grade change. Uh, uh, so that top of that 70 foot is about in line with the top of the YMCA and the, the top of those um, uh, kind of. Uh, pieces that sit on uh, sit above the the roof line of the mark and then of course the liberty loss as well and then we just have a couple of images existing on the right um, uh, again what a building like this could look like uh, on the left here and you can see uh, on third street looking between uh, those two homes uh, this is a view standing on liberty street um, looking looking towards the north you can see the ymca in the background the mark on the left and and the the kind of idea of the future tree line uh, trail coming through and then this is a view standing on washington street at the y looking to the east and to the south a little bit so the existing condition with that building um, that sits on the property line um, and I, I will note that the before and after of this from this image is a little bit challenging because you don't necessarily um, read the grade change here, but uh, you know the 35 foot setback of the new uh, building um, potentially uh, as, as we've articulated uh, from Washington Street and then 31 feet from the property line. And then finally, you know, I think it, it's just worth noting then, you know, that additional frontage that we talked about. Um, uh, we've begun some early conversations in conjunction with city transportation about how, um, you know, how that additional frontage could lead, but also connect to the larger idea of the Washington Street Bike Boulevard uh, that advances uh, some of the Vision Zero goals, the uh, YMCA drop off, uh, parking, and, and really just general safety along Washington Street in this frontage. And so, you know, these ideas are not ready to be shared, but we'll share them with you anyway, uh, because I think it contributes to the notion of what you could do with some of that space. And so, um, you know, as you think about improving um, the pedestrian safety at the intersection of Third and Washington, um, uh, you know, that additional space could be used to kind of uh, provide a, a, a small uh, chicane that could slow down traffic and still provide some parallel parking that could be drop off with clearer pedestrian connections across Washington Street to the YMCA and where the tree line trail crosses um, or using some of that space for some back in angled parking, uh, as you see in the top. Um, that again, some of this could be uh, drop off for the YMCA and, and others could be, um, uh, you know, uh, more public parking, uh, but, but then very clear um, uh, pedestrian crossing uh, moments for the trail and at the entry to the YMCA. And so, you know, I think, um, of course, these, um, 
ideas that have a long way to go, but but the idea that that we could benefit from some additional space in front of this Washington Street to improve safety is, is one we were interested in, in just talking about. And so um, we'll end with that. Um, there's there's one more view of the, the what it could look like and just talk about then, um, you know, what we think the next step is as we continue this conversation with you all um, and, and have a larger conversation about how um, the, this PUD process and, and these criteria can continue to meet uh, these goals. And so, um, you know, and the, and the larger question is, can we do all that and still uh, achieve financial viability as we think about, um, uh, you know, those several goals. And so uh, we started the, the process. There's a lot of stuff in progress. You can see as noted here on this slide as it relates to uh, remediation of the Brownfield site, uh, the tree line conversation, we continue to have conversations with the conservancy leadership, um, affordable housing, as, as we've, we've talked about, um, once we better understand the kind of mapping constraints, I think we can have a really robust and uh, solid understanding about what uh, what sources and and uh, amount of units uh, could be used to to advance that goal. Um, I've had some great conversations with the staff ornithologists as it relates to um, what the requirements for chimney swift health and safety would be throughout this entire process, um, and then continue to have the conversations with the the HDC. Uh, and, uh, and and Jerry and his team as we talk about the floodway and floodplain and then transportation folks as we talk, as we talk about Washington Street. So with all that information, I just wanna come back to this slide and, and hopefully um, we can leave this up on the, the, the screen as we um, uh, go through some of the questions that you've already started to put in your chat. Thank you. And are there are there some questions coming in that we can? There are, yeah. Um, so if we're ready to jump in, I can start going through them. Yep. Um, so I'll kind of just start up at the top and work the way my way down. Um, first question was how many total units in this PUD proposal? Yeah. So the the current number that we're looking at is a approximately 140 at this at this stage um, you know that's a number that is has continuously been in flux uh, as we continue to push and pull the massing that number will continue to change but um, but in the 140 ballpark as it stands today um, there's an, another question about affordable housing and so this one is asking um, if it's true that affordable housing will not happen here because the math in terms of construction offsets will not work. Um, and it, the, this question references how the low-income housing tax credits um, and other federal club subsidies um, and our own affordable housing millage doesn't permit construction in the floodplain. And so it's, uh, will not, those funds are not available. Um, so there's a question about that and, and also how it relates to the ground contaminants. Um, yeah. I'll do my best as that question touches on a lot. And I know Jennifer's on here somewhere as well, and she can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, part of the assumptions are absolutely correct. Um, there's probably no, well, there's absolutely no LIHTC and or use of the affordable millage um, here. And there is probably going to be significant costs um, associated with the contamination and the remediation of it. Um, we are in the process of punching some holes in the site right now to try to find the ter or determine the limits of that contamination and potentially what the costs would be. Um, we're making assumptions that the site will need to be remediated to a residential level, regardless of whether or not council um, uh, approves a residential development on top of it. So those, those assumptions are true. Um, what isn't true is that we have not given up on the idea that there can be some type of affordable housing here um, and how many units of it um, has not been determined yet. Part of the reason we're making the recommendation of this concept is because we believe it still gives us the best, uh, the best opportunity um, to both incorporate some um, affordable housing in it, whether that's at below 60% AMI or not, we don't know yet, whether that's between 60 and 120% AMI. Um, but we are definitely trying to incorporate and continue to pursue incorporating less than market rate housing on this site. 
um, and believe this, this concept gives us the best chance of doing that, as well as generating enough um, tax increment financing through the Brownfield program to also uh, remediate the contamination on the site, um, thus kind of wrapping that, that cleanup cost into the site, as well as producing enough TIF, which allows us to do public infrastructure to construct the tree line trail. All of those costs, upfront costs, would be absorbed by our development partner, but hopefully with the understanding that through the Brownfield program, the sites, the revenue created by the site, the tax increment created by the site would then go to pay the, that cost back over a number of years and actually makes the possibility of affordable housing, or I should say less than market rate housing possible. We all have a different definition of affordable. There's, there's several different definitions of affordable. Um, but that's a very long answer in, in trying to say we are doing our best to try to continue to create a concept and a project um, that would produce less than market rate housing um, as part of the project. Jennifer, you're muted if you want to. Sure am. Uh, if I could just add on to what uh, Derek said, the original analysis of city owned sites happened multiple years ago in 2019 prior to the city adopting an affordable housing millage so back then when you looked at all the different sites this was one of the harder ones um, to use leveraged funds from other outside sources such as tax credit financing um, to do a development for under 60 percent ami many other sites that we've looked at are easier to leverage outside funding for, but it doesn't mean there's no funding. And especially now that the city has adopted the affordable housing millage, and we can use those funds on a lot of the other sites that we're looking at. There are, there's other funds that don't have restrictions that could be used here, such as Derek already mentioned Brownfield, but also um, DDA affordable housing funds, uh, cash in lieu contributions that we get from private developers, um, the county mental health millage that is designated toward affordable housing. So all those kinds of funding sources can be used here. And because we have the additional millage now, um, it's it makes more sense that we could use those funds at this site where two years ago, it didn't make much sense to do that. Thank you. Okay. Um... There's a number of questions concerned about the congestion on Washington Street. Um, or is it a question about you know diverting traffic onto Liberty? Yeah, I think those are those are really good questions. And so in the conversations that we've had with the city uh, transportation team, we did again at a very early stage start to look at considerations um, for West Washington Street traffic. And, and, and tossed around all kinds of ideas. Um, and, and I think uh, maybe the high level consideration is that, that we are in a, in a state here uh, in the city where we're doing our best to reestablish the grid uh, for all modes uh, and, and ensure that, those, um, that, that that street grid uh, works for all modes and, and prioritizes certainly pedestrian and, and um, uh, bike safety, um, but, but doesn't create uh, the kind of one-way moments or dead-end moments or things like that as well. And so um, we do think that the concept here, of course, gives a lot of flexibility for what the actually design solution could be. Um, but the idea that um, the current state is, there's 150 parking spaces approximately on that site today that have access off of Liberty and Washington. Uh, and if we look towards the future, uh, in a way that we can um, better align those those drives uh, along Washington Street for safety, um, but still provide access off of, of Liberty like there is today. Uh, we think we think that, that kind of concept gives us the best chance, um, you, you know, for those kind of uh, public public right of way and, and safety uh, and, and congestion um, mitigation goals. Uh, so there's a number of questions that are, are looking at uh, about the floodplain. There is um, an initial question that I had typed an answer to 
um, about the mechanism for updating the flood maps um, and whether or not that is a part of this project. Um, and, and there's a, a number of concerns about this project potentially increasing um, flooding issues in surrounding neighborhoods and areas. Um, so I think a little bit more dialogue on how that's being approached would be helpful. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to handle some of that. Um, as the site sits, I believe the current building is, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, I think we've determined it's about six to 10 feet below um, the, flood, the flood line. Um, and I might get my, uh, uh, or my um, word, or definitions or words uh, mixed up between floodplain, floodway, and otherwise. But it sits below the floodplain now. Um, and the site's about 100%, I believe it's about 100% impervious um, with the contamination on site. And it sat there. Um, that way for the better part of a generation. Um, currently, there's no funds or money available um, to do anything to resolve that issue. Um, the, the proposed project most certainly proposes residential development within that floodplain. Um, we are proposing that this project and the development will meet all of the city's more recently adopted requirements for development within such a floodplain. Um, we also acknowledge willingly that that may not be or meet the 100th percentile of the city's uh, flood floodplain mitigation goals or, or plan, um, which would prefer to see less or nothing in here. Um, as we've said all along through this process, that this is a series of trade-offs to use this building or this project to resolve multiple issues, including the existing building within the floodplain, uh, below the floodplain. The new building would be four to 10 feet above or 12 feet above. Um, which we think is significantly better than what the current building um, is. Um, that will be uh, evaluated as part of this the submittal to staff and review. And, and the Planning Commission and City Council will get ample opportunity to discuss those trade offs and whether um, there's another way to go about resolving the current issue um, that wouldn't be so reliant on a building that doesn't meet the 100th percentile of the floodway or floodplain. Right now, to resolve all of the issues we've identified um, without any budget or without any money, we're attempting to develop the site in a manner that's respectful of the current ordinances, but also produces the ability to do all the other things we've talked about. Um, so I know there's a ton of questions about why in the floodplain, why in the floodway, why not um, nothing or why not uh, something different. Um, we believe right now that this project and the development that's being proposed is a conservative um, uh, building or concept to move forward with in an attempt to address all of those things, acknowledging that it doesn't meet the 100th percentile probably for any of them um, as an individual um, desire. So I'll leave it at that and, and we can move on to some of the other questions. Mike, and I, I think there's also a couple of questions in here that I'll jump on right now. Um, about uh, the PUD and whether a developer should be involved at this point or not. Um, this whole process was premised on the fact that in previous projects and the development of, of previous city-owned properties, that the city's um, uh, process was to go out for RFP and seek a developer first, and then partner with that developer to negotiate the development above ground. Oftentimes what you get is you get developers promising the city, the moon and the stars to win the RFP, and then you don't actually see what the proposed project is until after they've been awarded um, exclusivity on that site. It happened with CORE and it's happened with some other sites. What we heard was we want a process that entitles the project um, as a community driven process with, with staff in the city taking the lead. Um, it's risky for us. It puts us in a position to recommend a development to council that if nobody's interested in building um, could land with a giant thud. Um, and, and we may not have a development partner for it. That's why you will consistently hear us say what we are recommending is the conservative approach and one we think that generates the, the type of um, uh, improvement in value on the site to, to meet all of the goals. Um, the use of the PUD is, is quite simply because it provides us the most flexibility. Um, it allows us to entitle the project at a more conceptual phase and then work out the final details on the final site plans once a development partner is, is sought and we've contracted with them. So it's more of a two-step process of, as opposed to the traditional rezoning um, and site plan process, which requires all of the details up front. Um, that entitlement of the project gives the developer some insurance if they partner with us, that they understand um, at least at a minimum what has already been approved 
um, and that it's only a matter of the details left um, to negotiate with the Planning Commission and City Council. Um, yes, there's a question about, are we doing more pre-entitlement work on this site? Absolutely, we're doing 90% of the pre-entitlement work. We're taking on almost the, in the entire role as the developer on this site. Um, Jennifer is used to that. It's not something that uh, maybe city staff is, is used to as much, um, but we, we are working extensively to, to do all that work. And, and usually, like I said before, this would be the first time um, the community would see this project where you've seen that work and that entitlement work and the, and the engagement work we've done kind of done out in the open over the last year. Does the HDC typically get to override goals like reduce setbacks? No, the HDC can't um, re-legislate the requirements of the site. Um, what they do is they review the proposed building to determine if it is compliant with the Secretary of Interior's guidelines for, uh, for new construction within the historic district um, and evaluate the building based on those standards. Right there. Yeah. And uh, go ahead, I, Michael, I don't know if you want to jump in. I'm kind of cruising through what's left here. Yeah, there's a lot of good questions in here. I don't know, Brandon, if you have a, that you want to go through one by one or if we want to just keep keep going from top to bottom. Uh, there's another question about uh, the public parking. Um, I think that, that you had mentioned and whether or not that would be just along the street or if there would be additional parking on the site. Yeah, no, I think it's a, a good consideration. And again, again, uh, we'll qualify all that I'm saying here with this. It's an assumption that we're making that, um, you know, that this development has approximately 0.9 or one parking space per residential unit. And so based on that, the square footage that we'd be needing for that on the on the site, we do think there could be some additional um, space uh, here that, that could be given towards public parking um, if that were desirable. Um, yeah, I think there's another question in here, Brandon, that's, uh, that's related about, you know, what, what more, more space on Washington is not actually safer, right? Um, can, can, could we use some of that street space for, um, uh, for drop-off spaces or for, for accessible parking or other things like that? And I think that's all point well taken and, and all, all within the consideration. Um, you know, I think our point was just that, we have that space, so let's use it to design a, a safer space that maybe meets more of our uh, more of our goals. Are there other parking questions that you're seeing, team there's or one, Brandon, that we could? Yeah, there's one about the the 0.9 per unit. Um, why that that was a minimum, uh, and and why not, why not going lower than that? Essentially, um, for a more urban oriented developer. Yeah, I would certainly think that we should continue to refine what that language says as part of the PUD and whether that's a maximum or a, or a minimum. I think, again, we're at this stage kind of hedging on the approximation around that 0.9 or one parking space per unit um, as we balance the potential demand for um, uh, residential parking, but also uh, if you don't provide it on site, then are we pushing that parking further into the neighborhood? Um, I think, you know, those are, so there, I think we could, we could, the, the minimum versus maximum, I think is a really important conversation to have at this point as we think about kind of targeting that number and what number uh, would encourage developers versus preclude developers versus meeting up, meeting our community you know, eight to zero goals, I think is a really, really important conversation. But I think that we, we're conservatively around that 0.9 to one with the flexibility to go, to go in either direction as, as, as we see fit. Um, one last question related to parking, and I, I can answer this one real quick, um, was asking where they were on the site. Um, they are located kind of within the, the building footprint, the first floor will be primarily parking with um, you know, elevator kind of entry core similar to the Y. And then there will also be some parking on the second floor of the structure. Um, there's another question about the material of the siding of the building. Um, and I believe that the 
answer is that that is to be determined and would be a part of the next step of this process. Since this is just the pre-entitlement, um, that's a level of detail that we're, we're not at yet. That's right. It looks like um, a, a series of other questions as related to floodway, floodplain. Maybe we can start to um, click off some of those. Um, uh, the one I'm looking at says the parking lot at Krauss has contributed to significant flooding of the adjacent houses. How will this site be different? Um, I, I, I don't know about the specifics of that site, so I can only respond. Uh, to, to this site and, and it's important, I think, as we've articulated to differentiate between the floodway portion and the floodplain. And so, um, you know, the, the floodway portion of the site is intended to continue to move, move water in, in flood events. And so that, that will be important um, as we've articulated in the floodplain component here. Um, we think it's actually um, because the site is essentially, uh, you know, 100% impervious uh, as it state as it sits, both covered by building and, um, you know, gravel parking lot that has been you know, compacted such that that it's that it would be considered 100% impervious. Um, there is a potential here to, uh, um, uh, you know, de decrease the imperviousness or provide more pervious surfaces uh, here that I think. Uh, can both uh, allow for the beautification of the site, but also for um, uh, removal removal of structures that it, are in the floodplain and sit kind of in the floodplain uh, zone with the existing building, um, and uh, and meet some of the additional stormwater goals that that need to happen within the floodplain. So uh, we are still, as it gets to the details, Derek answered the question really well. I mean, I think um, the data that's available to us via FEMA provides. Um, very clear elevations of, of uh, floodway, floodplain, uh, and 500-year floodplain at both Washington Street and Liberty Street. Uh, we are we are uh, finalizing a survey right now that will better articulate exactly those elevations. But but Derek's numbers were were about right that that um, existing building um, it, it sits at about 800 foot elevation, which is anywhere between four and 10 feet. Um, below the floodplain elevation, uh, and we're proposing a building that um, uh, is, um, you know, top residential. The first level of residential uh, would be at about 812 or 813, so um, you know, significantly above floodplain yeah, elevation. And, I, and I'm still seeing a lot of questions and, and straight um, statements regarding the floodplain. What I can tell you is, is that council with the recommendation of staff just recently adopted a new set of more conservative regulations when it comes to development in the floodplain. Um, we understand that we have to meet those um, and that we have every intention of meeting them. Um, if, if, if the concern is that the new regulations don't address the issues that have been identified in the comments and the, and the questions that I've seen here, then, then we need to have a simple conversation with the staff and the folks that have, have, have made those recommendations to council and that that, you know, that that ordinance is supposed to protect the city against. Um, if it is a matter of specifically saying that we, we need to do more um, with this site and, and, and be more protective than, than those ordinances, we can have that conversation. But as we've said all along, that comes with trade-offs. Um, we are operating based on the assumption that this site needs to be developed to, to address the objectives that we've stated. Um, if the idea is, is that no, for, for any one uh, objective or, or reason, whether it be sustainability, the floodway or, or anything else, um, that that development should not take place and that that use or that concern should be given priority over all others, then yes, then this shouldn't be done. Um, but that what we're proposing is, is a building that meets those more restrictive adopted ordinances that are designed to protect the city against floodway concerns um, for development within situations like this to develop a building to create the possibility of addressing the rest of those issues as well. Um, I, I don't want to dismiss the floodplain questions, but we understand that what we are proposing is not um, 
is not ideal for the floodway issue only. Um, if that was the only consideration, then obviously this would not be the recommendation. But again, there's the existing situation that is also a problem for all of the same reasons and to a greater extent than what is being proposed um, with the building and the concept that's being proposed and no identified way to resolve what currently is the situation within that floodway either. So we understand the trade-offs that we are recommending to council um, and the planning commission. If they feel like that those trade-offs are not worth building this building or, or not that this isn't worth doing to address those trade-offs, then they will tell us. But right now, we, are, we have every intent of meeting those more restrictive regulations and are operating under the assumption that those are protective. Um, maybe not to the greatest extent um, possible, but that they're reasonable and that's why they've been recommended by staff and adopted by council. Um, I, there are two questions related to the chimney and the chimney swift. One um, references the yard apartments uh, resulting in the destruction of an old carriage building section um, that had provided some, there were some community benefits credit that are provided for the project, but ultimately the building was destroyed then rebuilt. Um, so the question is how will this project protect the chimney from the process of demolition and construction? Um, there's another question related to the chimney swifts um, and the ornithologists um, uh, the conversation is kind of uh, about the ornithologist and um, the city's ornithologist opinions as to whether or not the chimney swift will use based on the current design. Yeah, I can um, I can jump in on both of those, and I think it's a really important consideration. Um, so isolating the chimney conversation. Um, um, I think there's a couple of things at play here. Uh, there has been a structural analysis of the, the chimney to understand uh, if the chimney can stand while demolishing the existing building around it. And I think that the, you know, the general answer to that from this other consultant's opinion was yes. Um, although what we're currently doing as part of this process is looking at the kind of subsurface foundations of both of those structures to ensure that that is the case and what level of kind of um, uh, bracing and construction may, you may need to do in order to, to maintain the integrity of the chimney as the existing building were demolished. And so I think that's, that's one uh, piece of it. Um, uh, I would encourage you know, folks who haven't talked to the staff ornithologist, uh, Juliet Berger, she's um, an amazing uh, individual uh, who I think brings a lot of uh, wealth of knowledge in the topic to the community. And so um, maybe on the phone today even, but um, uh, yeah, I think there was some interesting uh, dialogue that we had um, regarding to the kind of migration patterns of the chimney swift, the time of day, uh, and the considerations that you might need to place um, on both uh, from a demolition and a construction um, uh, to ensure um, that, uh, that those swifts, uh, continue, uh, to come back, uh, to, to this chimney. Um, and then, yeah, I think we continue to work, um, uh, with those individuals and, and experts. I think being able to pr predict how, how birds will react is, is a, is a challenging, um, thing, but I think that's a conversation that we need to continue to have as it relates to uh, anything that happens in this site, um, as, as folks continue to prioritize, um, chimney swift habitat and health. Um, there's another question related to financing. Is there a precedent for similar projects that are designed to be self-financing? And what is the likelihood that a future millage may be required to offset costs? Um, I don't know the extent of kind of what's being discussed here, but I mean, I'll talk about just the high level analysis that we've run to date on um, the project at this kind of scale with the requirements. And um, um, we do think it's a, it's a the project that would be attractive, potentially attractive to, to some developers. Um, I, I do think we're asking for a lot um, uh, at this stage, but um, 
yeah, I don't know if there's like specific things that we want to get into or, or Jennifer, if you took that question a different way, is it related to the affordable housing components um, that you well, want to chime in on? Yeah, I was just, I wasn't really sure the, um, what the question was um, asking, so I can only interpret. Um, if there's similar projects in the community, like most projects are self-financed that are in the private sector. Um, or all of them that are done privately are self-finance. If you mean self-financed by uh, meaning there's not public subsidy, um, um, there could be equity investors, um, loans, that type of thing. Um, but that's how projects are financed. And uh, if it's a brown, if they use brownfield funds or brownfield TIF, um, that's been done multiple times. So that's there's nothing unusual on the financing thing. It's more on the side of the public benefits and expectations of what gets built on the site is what makes it challenging. There's, I don't know why or how, or I don't see why we would ever do a millage specifically for this site unless, I, I don't know why. I don't know why, why we would do that. I suppose it theoretically could happen, but it's definitely not something that we've discussed or planned or thought about doing. It would. It we're trying to make it something that will can be built by the private sector and also meet these public goals at the same time. There's another question just to tack onto that. Um, you know, directly, will millage funds be used on this site? Um, if we're talking about the recent affordable housing millage that was passed in November, no, uh, the the specifically uh, cannot be used on this site. Uh, there's a county mental health millage that was adopted um, many years ago that the city gets a portion back from the county that goes to um, essentially our general fund. Uh, and those types of funds could be used on the site. City general funds could be used on the site, um, but not the uh, recently adopted affordable housing millage. Uh, we have two people that are asking oh, whether or not... Yeah. The, these are condo or rental units. I would say not not determined at this state, um, unless Brett, Derek, you wanted to chime in. No, we don't know. We're, we have we haven't gotten that far. Nor would we, we we limit it to one or the other without having a development partner. Um, there's one question. Does the Treeline Trail still include the old Fingerly lot at William and First currently or, or being turned into green space? Um, I'm, I'm confident that portions of the Fingerly lot, either um, on it or adjacent to it, are still included in the Treeline Master Plan. Um, I don't think it's any secret that the University of Michigan bought most of it. Um, I don't think there's been any agreements on if and when and how that would be turned into green space or a portion of the tree line at this point. There's another um, question that was tree line related that I'm looking at that talks about analysis on tax base related to the tree, tree line building in the floodway and floodplain. Um, I don't know that we have an answer to that. Um, but it would certainly be worth checking in with the, the tree line conservancy team. I'm sure they'd be willing to provide answers separately. Um, there's another question that um, related to traffic. And so it, it's asking, um, it said that Smith Group's been involved in plans um, that have ultimately dumped traffic on to the Old West Side, uh, examples First Street and 7th Ave. What, uh, what impacts do you expect with this plan? Well, I mean, I think that would it is part of the both traffic analysis that will be done where we are working with Wade Trim to develop an appropriate traffic analysis uh, that's in line with the concept plan. Um, and, and then there will, of course, be tra further traffic analysis uh, as it relates to future, um, uh, you know, area plan and, and site plan um, submittals. And so, um, you know, I, I think 
though, at, you know, from a traffic impact statement, um, as, as we look at it from, from the outset, um, similar, similar number of, of uh, potential cars coming in and out of this space from existing conditions to, to propose. But um, I'll defer to the traffic experts as, as we get deeper into that. see a couple of questions not to jump in here um, on the contamination and the cost and the budget for the real estimate dealing with these contaminants. I think there's a couple of questions on. Um, we're in the process of, of punching holes in the site right now um, to de determine the extent of it. Um, it's a city owned property, which um, it makes it difficult for us from a brownfield perspective and, and the use of brownfield funding to, to remediate the site. What we're proposing is that um, the development partner will cover the cost of any environmental remediation to the site. So they will have to absorb those costs into their budget um, and, and pay, that, pay for them and, and complete that work prior to any above ground construction taking place on the site to a standard determined by the city. Um, they will, however, differently than us as the city, as the owner, um, be eligible for um, tax increment financing to reimburse them for the cost of that cleanup. Um, I don't wanna get into the, the depths of, of tax increment finding, but it's basically, we can capture the increased assessment on the site based on the development and, and take 100% of that cost and use that to reimburse the developer for both the environmental cleanup and public infrastructure costs, um, which is where, what we're proposing and to pay for the cleanup and to pay for the construction of the component of the tree line trail and hopefully uh, improvements to Washtenaw Street um, to make it safer and, and a more efficient street for everybody. Um, that, that is only possible because right now the assessed value of the site is zero as a city owned property, which means any, any new development on the site um, creates a significant uh, amount of what we call the increment. Um, that would be able to be captured for a period of up to 30 years and reimbursed to um, the owner of the site or the developer in this instance to pay for all of that. Um, that's in our minds, that's the only way this works because there's no budget right now to pay for the environmental cleanup, um, the construction of the tree line trail or the improvements to Washington. That's not to say that council couldn't put that money aside, um, but right now it's not there. Um, so we are proposing to use that increment to pay for all of those activities. However, someone needs to pay for them up front. Um, and that's where a, a private development partner comes in um, to finance the project, um, to be able to come in and pay for all of those things and the above ground construction. And then we reimburse them over a period of 30 years for that upfront construction or, or that upfront remediation and public infrastructure. Um, that's my best answer at this point. We, we will have a better answer. We are doing very limited um, uh, evaluation for, for environmental uh, conditions on the site right now, so we have a better idea. Um, but the more we do up front, the less that's reimbursable. Um, the more that's done by the development team, the more that's done um, post adoption of a brownfield plan, um, the more that becomes reimbursable. So the more money we spend up front, the less of that is reimbursed through that increment. So it's a delicate balance we're trying to strike, strike between knowing what's out there and having estimates um, to work with a development partner and leaving as much of that potential cost to the, to the uh, post Brownfield process where that, where, that, where that reimbursement becomes eligible. I'd like to read, um, this isn't a question, it's a statement, um, just so it gets on the record. As a neighbor on Kraus Street, I simply wanna indicate my support for redevelopment of this property. I appreciate deeply the commitment to less than market rate housing, the tree line trail, improvements to West Washington streetscape. I look forward to new neighbors, blight removal and new energy in the neighborhood. Just a couple other that we can read as we're getting to, to some additional questions. Um, this one says, I'm a fifth ward resident, not at all concerned about floodplain and congestion questions. Efforts should be focused on reducing parking, reducing setbacks, 
and increasing the housing density of this development. There's a question on um, uh, other modes of transit besides bicycles. Suppose many people don't use cars. What are the allowances for dozens of bicycles, e-bikes, e-scooters, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. And then it's built into our assumption for use of the, the ground floor plane. We just haven't quite articulated that yet. And so um, that will be part of the, the PUD concept plan middle uh, we'll make sure we have the appropriate accommodations for a uh, uh, number of bikes uh, and the and, the, and potentially exceeding that as it relates to the, the city goals um, I think those are those are all things that that um, that we can accommodate in those first first two two levels there was also a question Brandon I was looking at about um, fire lane access you know what explain the fire lane um, I think that probably is referencing the sketch that the kind of site plan sketch, um, you know, in our early conversations uh, with the fire marshal uh, and, and team at the city, uh, understanding the need for aerial access uh, to the building on two sides um, at a minimum. And so, um, you know, we're providing a 31 foot setback off the west property line to, to be primarily utilized um, for that fire lane access and then not having to have that the fire, the fire truck have to back out but uh, can proceed through the site. Um, I also think that as has been articulated, um, we need to be clear that that um, the similar space within that 31 feet, uh, we'd be providing a, a drive access for, for residential parking units that happen on the, the ground floor and, and the potentially on the second floor of this of this proposal. Um, there was a there's a question here that says doesn't the city's role as developer on the site create a conflict conflict of interest? I think uh, Derek, you may be better suited to answer this, but um, the, the intention is not that the city is the developer uh, on this on this process. Um, there's a question here that says, are there other options that the city would consider uh, other than this one? I don't know if Derek's still with us and can chime in or has already answered that question. Yeah, I, I am. Um, obviously, we would listen to anybody's options. Uh, what we're as long as the options presented do um, what we're proposing to take to council, like I said, it is to address all of those objectives and to um, to utilize the site to pay for them um, without creating any additional uh, pressure or, or need for payment from the general fund or other sources of the city. Um, we'd be able to consider, we'd be willing to consider, and anybody who has another option would be able to respond, ultimately this will go out to RFP. We're not gonna hand pick a developer, that's not what the city does. Um, we're not gonna pick an individual one. What we'll take is this, this titled site and the approvals, package that up into a request for proposals and then allow developers to submit um, uh, based on that. At that point, they'll be able to submit whatever they want, um, but we would expect that whatever comes in meets the minimum objectives that have been established by council and approved as part of the project. There's a question from council member on Maui about uh, at what point in this process will there be a qualified and quantified subsidized housing that is being discussed as less than market rate housing? Um, and also what contract assurances will be in place to guarantee less than market rate housing. I can start and then Jennifer, you may be able to chime in, uh, you know, uh, um, or Derek too. I mean, the process is that uh, we are actively working with the Historic District Commission to understand um, via the, the Secretary of the Interior standards, uh, what if any, building massing would be acceptable within the context of the Old West Side Historic District once we have, uh, I think, a good indication of that and or approval. 
uh, we can begin with confidence to then uh, have a better understanding of the number of units that this project could yield. And then, of course, have the conversation as has been articulated about, um, you know, uh, cost of that of that building and financing uh, capabilities of, of a potential deal that could include affordable um, units at certain levels and then other sources that could be used in conjunction with some of the other community driven goals. So I don't know, Derek or Jennifer, if you would add to that or answer that differently, but. I mean, I, Ben, you want to go or I can, I mean, the simplest way to put it is, is the more value that's uh, generated from the development on the site, uh, the, the more funds there are to pay for the community objectives we've listed and subsidize the cost of the units. Um, because the more value the site has, the, the less value it has, the more it becomes a balancing act um, between what revenue and, and value was generated from the site um, and how much money is available to meet those community objectives we've discussed and subsidize units in the building. Um, we've already identified and talked extensively that the, the use of the affordable millage and or LIHTC deal here is probably non-existent. Um, potentially other funds maybe to, that would help subsidize these units above what the value of the site will do. But that's the exact balance in act we're doing is how much development we put on it creates value um, from the development partner um, we're, it also depends on how much council is willing to, how much they want to see out of the land value. Right now, we're working on an assumption that um, land value is secondary to meeting these objectives. We do not believe we're going to see a, 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 lot, a windfall of cash from selling this site, nor do we think we're going to get a bunch of money from the land that we see there. We are basically assuming that all of the value of the site should be put back into these community objectives, including the creation of less than market rate units, which will be, have to be subsidized through that value. That is a conversation we're gonna to continue to have with the Planning Commission and City Council as we go forward, but that is the exact balance. The concept we're bringing forward, we believe will create the value to both attract the development partner handle those objectives and gives us the best chance of being approved by the HDC and subsidizing some units, all using the value generated from the site, not asking for money from anywhere else. Um, if some of those objectives, if the need to um, generate value to redo Washington Street is, is falls off as a priority, then there may be less development needed on the site to generate the same amount of less than market rate units or we can keep the number of units on the site and the value the same and subsidize more units. So this is, these are the trade-offs and the balancing act we're trying to do through this process. And that will continue to happen through the council approval. Isn't it um, fair to say that when we get to city council for approval, we will have figured that out and we'll let council know this is the minimum uh, and this is the income level uh, that we are putting in the PUD um, as a commitment. And then um, once a developer is selected and, and the site plan is finalized and we move forward with the actual project, there will be a requirement to have a developer agreement that like any other PUD that requires those types of commitments, all the different public purposes. Yeah, I mean, if, if that's a question, either in the PUD, a range, of units at different AMIs um, with the ability for council to adjust that depending on proposals. Um, it could go out as a requirement in the proposals. Don't submit to us unless your project includes X number of units. Um, council could tell us they would prefer less, 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 less than market rate units, but less density on the site. They could tell us we want to see more, less than market rate units, so increase the density on the site. Um, Again, what we're proposing right now and what we're taking through entitlement through the process is a project we think best meets that balancing. But yes, it can be in the PUD and or the proposal requirements. Yeah. There's a question here that says, why are the costs associated with the improvements to Washington Street being assessed to this project when the area is in the DDA jurisdiction and could be funded by the DDA? Uh, I just want to clarify, I don't, I don't I think the assumption here is that this the project would cover the cost of West Washington Street improvements uh, between third and the tree line or third and the railroad tracks. 
uh, we just wanted to make sure that we're considering it from a planning perspective at this stage. Um, and uh, I don't know, Derek, if you wanted to add to that. So. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe, I, I mean, Michael, it is my intent that hopefully it can um, cover okay. those costs because I don't think there's been any any funds identified um, for that. Um, the more the more public infrastructure improvements we can get out of using the increased value of this private development um, or what ultimately will be a private development, um, the less money we have to pull from the DDA or other sources to do it. Um, if council doesn't want the, that value to go back into public infrastructure, we don't have to do it. Um, or if there's not enough value created to pay for that public infrastructure, then this would be one of the things that might drop off. Um, but my hope is, is that there isn't enough value created to wrap the initial costs up of that improvement into the development. We'll see as the numbers play out. Um, there's a direct question that's been answered kind of indirectly, but I'll raise it here. It's the, it says, why does the building have to be so tall? Uh, Principally 70 feet, could it be two stories shorter? And I think as, as has been stated, you know, we're, we're trying uh, to accommodate this balancing act of a project that's appropriately scaled to produce um, a number of development units that can accommodate a series of those uh, goals. Um, you know, the easy way to reduce this building by, by you know, 10 feet or, or a story would be to, to require less parking on this site, right? Because we're showing two levels of parking and that, that could add residential units. Um, but I, th I think, you know, at this stage, we're conservatively kind of approaching that. But um, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question that I wanted to answer directly since it was such a direct question. Um, there's a question here that asks, how will a development partner be selected? Will there be an open bidding RFP process with set criteria? Um, I think that that is the intent, um, assuming uh, that this this continues to move forward through um, city council approval. Uh, uh, once that PUD approval is, is accommodated, the idea would be uh, uh, to develop a, a public RFP process that has the set criteria um, uh, uh, to uh, to send to the development community. Uh, I see Dan answered one of the questions in here that says the tax question for the tree line will take some research. Please contact her. <laughs> so there you go. Go ahead, Brandon. Sorry. No, um, you're good. So there, there's a question uh, kind of going back to the affordable units. Um, doesn't the PUD ordinance have a formula for how many units on affordable housing or money in lieu and a certain AMI for it based on the unit estimate just provided as an estimate tonight, what would that formula yield and at what AMI? Yes. I understand. And, yeah, I think Tom, the, the answer to that is yes and I don't know yet. Um, since, since we read a comment of support, I do want to read a comment of not support. This is a comment from a resident on Crow Street that says, I do not think building in the floodplain is a good idea and we need alternatives to more market rate housing. It is unlikely there will be affordable housing on this site. There's a, a question um, on the aesthetics of the building. Um, it says that you want to build in a historic district. Is there a way to design something that looks less like a prison? Um, I would answer that yes, and whatever we decide needs to be approved by them. Um, currently, we have not spent a, a, a we have spent the majority of our time figuring out these these other issues as far as massing size. Um, and how to deal with the, the, the multitude of issues developing the site. As it moves forward, the elevations are certainly going to be rounded out and more detail will have to be provided to the Historic District Commission. They ultimately will have the, the, the lion's share of the say on what the building looks like from an aesthetic standpoint. 
related to that, there's another question I'm asking what windows would be used. Um, there are windows that minimize reflection and deter birds from crashing into them. Um, I think you know, related to that, the last question, because these are um, details that are, are uh, the plan is, the, the design is not that far along yet in terms of those kind of decisions. This is um, the bigger picture kind of massing decisions right now. Um, and so the, the actual look of the building, you know, is um, still to be determined. There's a, a question, uh, has any, oh, go ahead, Michael. I was just um, scrolling, so keep going, Brandon. Has anyone expressed interest in developing this site in the past? Has it ever been on the market since the city acquired it? Why not put up, uh, put it up for sale and see what happens using um, transaction agreement to ensure city goals are met? I think the short answer to that is because the city's previous experiences with that, not specifically this site, have not produced um, projects that the city decided to move forward with or that the city was comfortable with. Um, what, was what was proposed here is that prior to a, a developer driving or instead of a developer driving um, the design and, and development process that it would be done um, by staff and, and the community and then taken to a developer. Um, this is unusual. Usually it is just put up for sale or put out for an RFP. Um, but again, then this process starts over with a developer doing all of the work that's been done in the last year um, behind the scenes, not in a public manner, um, and bringing forward a project at this point um, where all of this has been done without any um, real public inclusion or engagement. I don't know if this is the best way to do it or not, but what we have decided is in these instances where these difficult sites exist and ones that have historically um, not had solutions to the existing problems was to try something different and to entitle them as a community and have these conversations be staff driven prior to seeking a private development partner. Taking that, um, what we believe is we understand that it needs to be something that will, will generate interest from the private development community, um, but to do all the upfront work um, as a community as opposed to allowing a developer to drive the process or do it first. There continues to be a lot of comments on parking and number of parking spaces. Um, uh, I'll read um, one comment here that encapsulates a lot of these. I would uh, I would like consideration for less parking. Unparked units will be more affordable. One concern expressed by the presenter was that looking was that parking would be quote pushed into the neighborhood uh, if there wasn't enough bread on site. Is that accurate? I thought that the surrounded blocks have residential permits. There are hundreds of units downtown that do not have parking associated with them and lightly parked buildings are more in line with a two zero goals. Um, so I appreciate the, those considerations and, and then again I'm seeing um, several comments regarding kind of parking too that, that fall in line. Yeah, we're, we're, we're working with uh, um, the recommendation right now that there be a maximum of one per unit. Um, that's a working recommendation. I, I don't think there's any, any way that the Planning Commission and City Council isn't gonna have a very robust discussion about whether we should um, set that maximum at, at less um, and more. I think there needs to be some input as to, we can set it at, at whatever we want, but if we, if we can't find a private development partner to build it and get it financed, um, then that's a problem as well. And, and this effort has been wasted. So it is gonna be a balancing act to talk about parking right now. Um, we're at recommending a maximum of one per unit, um, but I think that's gonna be a very significant discussion once we get this in front of the planning commission and city council. And they're, they're gonna drive what they think is reasonable. We will do our best to find out if, if what they believe the maximum should be um, is going to prevent any development interest. But ultimately, um, if it can't be developed in a manner that's consistent with council's uh, goals and objectives and planning commissions, 
then maybe we should go in a different direction. Um, if they decide that a maximum this shouldn't be parked and we can't find a development partner that'll do it, then um, we'll have to reevaluate what can be what can be done here. Derek, there's a question here that says, how much has the city spent on pre-entitlement process for 415 West Washington to date? I think, I think, I don't have the exact number. I think we spent about $100,000 in community engagement and environmental and survey work to date. Um, that's, that money was pre-approved by council. And then just recently we got approved for up to, to 196,000 and change um, from the DDA to do the entitlement work. So I would imagine by the time we have a project that is um, able to go out to RFP, we, have, we will have spent about a quarter of a million dollars um, on entitlement work and engagement work. There's a comment slash question here that says in the past, I believe that both the Kiwanis and a local arts group had inquired about adaptive reuse of the existing structures on site in addition the Allen Creek uh, Watershed Group and other Greenway planning documents suggested this using the site as an anchor green space on the Greenway. In addition, there appears to be at least one local developer who had proposed adaptive reuse for artist workspace, farm market, and other community interactive uses. Why weren't those options previously presented in surveys conducted and why not at least put an RFP for other possibilities prior to spending the money on pre-entitlement? Is maximum uh, dollar return the only community value attached to the site? Uh, uh, there's a few different things in there. One, um, nonprofits. Um, I've spoken with a few, in, including the arts community. Um, I think there's a lot of people who would be interested in the site, but to date, no one's come forward and said they had um, the ability or financing to, to develop the site for any of those nonprofit type uses. Um, we'd be willing to talk to anybody who is a nonprofit who came forward who, who felt um, that they had an idea for the site. And I'm sure council would be glad to discuss it with them. But to date, nobody has come forward with an actual plan or, or an option for developing it in a manner that would be consistent with those ideas. Um, we have even talked about incorporating them into um, space that may be created here. Um, and to date, we haven't had any, in, any confirmed um, interest or, or anybody who has, has the ability to, to um, to, le to lease that type of space. We we'd be glad to talk to them. As far as the uh, developer who's come forward, I've met, him, I've met with him on several occasions um, and invited him to submit his proposal to, to, my, to myself or city council, we've offered to work with him. We don't generally work with or provide exclusivity to an individual developer that isn't part of a response to a proposal, um, but we understand that he has an idea um, that would include adaptive reuse of the existing building. As we've stated before, that's that causes its own problems because the existing building is is less in conformance with our floodplain regulations than what we're proposing, um, but certainly more in line with the HDC's goals for adaptive reuse. Um, we've invited him to submit that proposal. I've talked to him on several occasions. I, I think it's a great plan. Um, he's provided no information on on how and, and to what extent he would be able to finance that or whether or not the project generates enough money um, and, and revenue to do and meet the other community goals associated with this, including the construction of the tree line and some of the other things. Uh, many of the concerns that have been brought up here um, are not incorporated into that plan as well. Um, but those are, again, those are trade-offs that could be considered. We would encourage him to submit if this project does go out for RFP, just because we've entitled it, doesn't mean council won't consider other proposals. Um, and if they're considered value or, 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 um, or more desirable to move in that direction. Um, and as far as revenue being the, the only or the driving consideration, it is to the extent that it's necessary to achieve those objectives. Um, we are not proposing that this site be maximized so as to generate revenue for the general fund or, or to, to, to finance other projects only what is necessary to meet those objectives and provide the best opportunity to create some less than market rate housing. That is the extent to which the revenue from this site is considered important um, as far as staff is concerned. If, if those objectives are eliminated from what is, what is desirable that this site pay for, then the, the, the required revenue will go down 
um, and the need for density would go down. If the desire for more to be accomplished is put on there, then we would, we would recommend additional development to, to finance that. Um, that is the sole driver of, of what we are recommending as a concept is to generate enough revenue to accomplish those goals, which are primarily uh, the remediation and the environmental, the construction of the tree line, um, the creation of, of less than market rate housing to the greatest extent possible, um, improvements to Washington Street and any other public infrastructure um, improvements that are necessary to make this project go. Thanks, Derek. There's another comment here and a question that says, I recall that at a public Zoom meeting over an hour ago, Jerry Hancock said that, quote, with his floodplain manager hat on, I don't think we should build in the floodplain. I understand that council gave you a multitude of asks for this site and you're trying to meet them. Has it occurred to you as staff and as Smith Group consultants that you might honestly tell council that their multitude of asks for the site is unrealistic, that they're trying to fit around the peg in a square hole? Council are not professionals. They would appreciate honest opinions from experts, I believe. Um, I, can, I can chime in here, Derek, and I know you can too, as both a consultant and a, a fifth ward resident. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this site and I do think um, that uh, there is an option um, that can that will meet not a hundred percent of the goals, a hundred percent of them, uh, but uh, a high percent of these goals at a, at a high percentage. And um, I, I think um, I think it's worth continuing to to fight for these compromises in our in our community. Um, and in, and if we get to the point in this process that we don't think it's possible, absolutely, we will we will come back with a recommendation that it's not feasible and and we don't think that we should continue to pursue uh, uh, the goals because the trade offs aren't worth it. I would agree. I mean that's that's why we've taken as long as we have to date. This has been uh, going on for over a year, um, and we're trying to be as methodical and, and as thoughtful as we can. Um, of course, there's a point where we come if if we can't if we don't think. Um, that we can achieve those objectives with something that's reasonable or at least put something in front of council for them to make that determination. It really shouldn't be staff. Um, what, we're, what we're striving for is to give council a re something to reasonably consider um, as they look at those trade-offs. Um, if we don't think it's at work, I have no problem recommending against it. This is not easy. Um, this is not an easy process to go to. In, in 20 years of doing this, this is one of the more difficult sites I've ever worked with. Um, I think everybody would agree with it. Um, but to date, we haven't come to the conclusion that the site can't do what we need it to, um, to, to put it out for consideration for a partner. That's, that's, the, that's the place we're at right now. Um, and that there is not enough evidence that it can't do what we need it to, to stop the entitlement process. We believe there's still a reasonable chance um, based on all the, uh, the work and investigation that's been done to date, that this, this, this concept may have the ability to, to do what we need it to do to, to meet these objectives. If we get to that point where, where we don't, then I have, I've stood in front of council on countless occasions and told them not to do something. Um, we as staff and, and the people who work here don't want to be associated with something um, that fails. Um, it, it's as simple as that. Um, there's a couple of comments in here that say if moving to a smaller FAR concept has not placated the anti-development activists, why wouldn't we maximize the FAR on site? Um, and I, again, I, I'll go back to our, our comment that I, 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 again, the process did look at a series of different options back in 2019, uh, and there were strong feelings on both sides of the kind of minimal development and maximal development side and and uh as we looked at the 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 you know quantity and and kind of breadth of community driven goals um uh, the thought was that um that, a, that some sort of compromise was the appropriate way to continue to to move forward um We have a question um, on Washington Street again. The Y is an important community resource with chronic parking and traffic stress. The plan only seems to add parking stress to the area. Comment? 
I don't know if it adds. Um, like I said, there's 150 parking spaces on the site now um, that are all, or for the most part, are peak hour trips um, that come in at, at, at peak hour morning and leave at peak hour afternoon. So um, this may be a different stress, um, but we think we, uh, uh, in conjunction with the ability to make improvements to Washington Street and improve and, and potentially redirect some of that traffic um, from where it is now, um, and improve the improve Washington Street. Um, I genuinely believe it could be a better situation than the 150 parking spaces that are there now. There's a comment that says the city drilled cores on the site 20 years ago. I saw the drilling service in the yard. They should share this information with you and the public. Um, to my understanding, all, all information that's uh, regarding the kind of you know, public, you know, understanding of environmental contamination and, and study, both with this process and with others, um, has or will be shared publicly. We, we are continuing to understand the impacts of uh, environmental contamination, and um, uh, which, is, which has been public. I think that's kind of wi widely known. I think the question we're asking now is um, uh, what what needs to be done to remediate that to residential uh, to allow for residential um, adjacent to and on top of so yeah there's I, I have, add to that yeah I have sitting on my desktop I have a, the phase one and phase two I don't know if they were done 20 years ago but I have a phase one and phase two that was done in the past um, I'd be glad I, I think we're able to make those available on a on the website I think we have a website up and running for the site don't we Michael where, where information is available um, yeah, we have one and there's one on the city side, so we can put them on both for sure. Yeah. Um, so that's out there. I can look for any previous environmental studies. It, it needs to all be redone again um, because of reliability issues. So we started that process. I think they were out there last week, punching limited holes in there. So, and our environmental consultants that, um, have all that information. So um, it'll help truncate what we need to do on the site. But anytime you have that type of gap in, in timing, you need, to, you need to go out and look at it again. There, there was a comment that just came in. Um, it seems like there might still be some confusion in the room around affordable housing um, and less than market rate housing. So this comment says, when you said a quote, less than market rate housing, are you referring to on affordable housing? I thought it was established that there cannot be affordable housing. Can I take that one? Um, yep. There's never been established that there cannot be affordable housing only that certain types of financing that is often used for affordable housing uh, cannot be used on this site um, so it's harder to leverage um, outside resources like the biggest sources of um, funding for affordable housing is low-income housing tax credits hud a little bit um, and then we have of course our affordable housing millage that just got passed in november um, not, none of those three sources can be used on this particular site, but there's other sources that can be used as well as um, just being absorbed by the developer as part of the development process, um, whether they use Brownfield uh, TIF or whether, they, uh, whether the PUD process itself requires a certain percent of affordable housing, um, it can be financed in other ways. And so you, we, if, if, Council desires there to be affordable housing here, it can be done. It can be done um, through those means or it can be done with um, other non-restricted type of local financing, um, such as uh, DDA affordable housing fund, the city's affordable housing fund, um, the county mental health millage that was passed um, a few years ago that has a portion dedicated to affordable housing. Those sources can also provide additional subsidy um, as needed. So it's more of a how much um, how much do we want at the site? Uh, what are the income levels uh, that we're targeting and how much of that can be absorbed by whatever design is approved by city council? We just got a question in that's similar to one above. Given all the questions regarding the floodplain that were raised, um, and you no doubt anticipated, why wasn't Jerry Hancock invited to this Zoom to handle those questions? Um, and there's another one as well that was asking why Jerry Hancock was not involved in this meeting. Uh, 
um, Jerry's, Jerry's been, um, you know, involved in our process that we had a meeting with Jerry, uh, last week and, um, we continue to keep him connected to the process and, um, continue to welcome his feedback and input. Derek, I, I don't know if there's other things you want to add. No, I mean, we, we, this is the, this is the time where this project comes into the city for review by staff, not only Jerry, but, um, you know, Dr. Stoltz, the fire marshal, everybody's going to get an opportunity to review this and provide their thoughts to the council. Um, we understand that through individual lenses, depending on where your area specialty is, that this project may or may not be um, in the best interests of that, that specific area. We, we understand that. Um, we've been charged to bring a project forward that, that meets those trade-offs, all of staff. There is a plethora of staff, including traffic and environmental and stormwater and solid waste and floodplain, um, sustainability, affordable housing, um, planning, who are all gonna get their first crack at this, starting with whenever that, that submission is made. Michael, I don't know when we're gonna have that packet ready, um, but similar to the, the library lot and, and so, or the Y lot and some other projects we've brought forward, um, it'll get a full staff review and everybody will have a chance to provide their information that they feel is relevant to council based on an actual proposed project. Um, it won't be a conceptual discussion, but it will be actually be a review to, to determine if these projects meet um, and are technically compliant with city code and regulation that are designed um, to inform council on whether or not these projects are, are, are reasonable within the space they're developed. And then also provide any recommendations for how council should consider going above and beyond those. Um, but they should not be answered and, and those, those individual um, disciplines should not drive the process yet. Council should see those responses um, in total and together. So they're able to make a, a decision based on all of the input from all of the different disciplines and recommendations and decide if they want this project to go forward. Michael, I know we had a, a stop on this at seven. Is, is there anything else out there that um, we haven't touched on at this, at this point? I, 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 it, again, I appreciate all of the questions and, and comments, and, and we do want to re, be respectful of everyone's time. We, we received and uh, answered a lot of questions. Um, I think there are a couple that um, we haven't explicitly answered, but we will, I think it was generally answered, and, and uh, our intention is to publish in the recording of this meeting in addition to the, the questions that have been asked with answers. Uh, to them. And so our team will work to do that over the next uh, several days and, and, and get that published um, on the, on both the city's website and the project website. Um, yeah, if we, have, if we so, have an answer to specific questions, we're going to be able to sort through these, answer them in writing and then publish those answers, correct? That's the intent. Yep. That's what we're going to, yeah. that's what we'll be working on. Um, uh, and, and then to your point, Derek, I wanted to just emphasize that, um, you know, the, the process, from here is uh, we intend to go back to the Historic District Commission uh, with a revised proposal. They have not seen uh, what's currently on the screen. You all saw today, they saw a previous version of this. And so that is upcoming and provides another opportunity for input from the community. Um, uh, upon if approval from the HDC is uh, received, um, then the staff review that you articulated will happen. And, and then, then we go to Planning Commission with additional a chance for input um, and uh, city council with additional chance for input. So um, I, I, I just want to reiterate and, and Derek, I'll give you the last word, but I want to reiterate my thanks to everyone for spending um, your time with us today. I know um, in the era of over Zoom life that um, it's difficult to um, commit to more, more time, especially in the evenings. Um, and, um, and this conversation means a lot to, to us and to the city and, uh, and we appreciate it. So Derek, any final closing words? Um, just that we're gonna sit back and, and go through all of these questions afterwards. Um, and, if I, and if I believe, or, or as a team, we believe that we need to do this again, 
um, to go through this without the presentation and maybe just go through a question and answer period with a, with a few slides and a shorter presentation. We'll do this, but I, I want a chance to regroup and go through all of these comments and, and make a determination on whether they're derivations of questions that have already been asked and answered, or if there's a, um, a significant amount of questions in here that, that um, we haven't provided some type of answer to, and that we can't expound on those answers as part of the, uh, the presentation and, and the process that goes forward to the HDC and other boards and commissions in the city. So um, stay tuned. We, we may need to do another one of these, depending on what that review turns up. But other than that, thank you. Like I said, we, we understand um, there's, a, there's a lot in this project and there's a lot of reasons why we're doing it. We understand that through any one lens, um, it's, it's probably not going to be um, the most appealing project when you look at it through any one, one lens. We certainly understand the floodplain issues and anticipate that the Planning Commission and City Council is going to have some very difficult decisions to make about whether or not they want to um, allow a project that meets current regulations for development of floodplain or whether they feel like based on current climate conditions and, and considerations that uh, being more protective than what the current ordinance allows is the prudent course of action and whether or not they want to downsize this or um, maybe move away from it altogether and go in a different direction. Um, we plan on doing our best job to provide a project that gives them a reasonable opportunity to make those considerations and determinations um, based on something that's reasonable um, versus what those additional protections may be. And that's really what we're trying to do. So I know that doesn't satisfy anybody, but we hope everybody stays um, you know, engaged throughout the process. There's going to be a lot more to come before this is done. So thank you. Thanks, Al. Have a good night.